It's kind of interesting that in a narrative involving a wolf deity, one of the main driving forces is a pursuit of cold hard cash. Spice and Wolf is often referred to as economics, the anime, among its fans, but those not in the know might mistakenly take that as an insult. In true, Spice and Wolf takes something that seems dry and mundane and shows us just how gripping and tense it can be. In particular, I love how economics is woven directly into its drama, reflecting not in only Lawrence's aspirations, but also in his and Hollow's relationship. Spice and Wolf delves into topics such as the principles of trade, supply and demand, inflation versus deflation, even basics of the stock market. But it never feels like a college lecture, and even goes into some important truths of reality that aren't taught in the classroom, like just how low people will stoop to make a quick buck, and the difficulties that come with living a trader's life. But the question is, just how accurate is it? Author Isuna Hasakura said he was inspired by a book aptly named Golden Spices, The Rise of Commerce in the Middle Ages. Let's see how closely Spice and Wolf matches his basic concepts, and explore the many lessons the anime teaches, both about economics and about life. Our first lesson comes quickly, as Hollow has to prove her worth to Lawrence. She does this using one of the oldest tricks in the book. Lying? Okay, okay, let's call it advertising. For any trade to actually occur, you need someone to actually want what you're selling. Hollow takes the role of a traditional peddler, and spins her words in a way that has Lawrence's potential buyer eating out of the palm of her hand. She doesn't just net Lawrence a hefty amount of coin, she also shows off her cunning and mischievous nature. No matter how good of a merchant you are, you won't get anywhere if you aren't persuasive, and Hollow proves that she can be the social complement to Lawrence's years of experience. As the anime goes on, we learn that Hollow is more suited to life as a trader than one would think. Not only is she sharp-witted and quick on her feet, she easily sees through Zarin and his plan. She notices that he's not telling the entire truth, and eventually helps Lawrence realize that his tip about coin purity is straight up wrong. Zarin tells him that a certain silver coin is due to be replaced by one of a higher concentration of silver. This means that if one were to buy a bunch of the old stock, and exchange them later, you've essentially made a profit with almost no effort whatsoever. Most countries these days have abandoned the gold and silver standard since the early 1900s, but coin purity was very much a major concern for the denizens of the Middle Ages. Just like how Lawrence and Hollow have to juggle several different kinds of currency and their ever-changing values, the average French merchant also had to deal with each town minting their own coins. Eventually, the various world leaders began to manipulate the purity of silver in their money in an attempt to sneakily obtain a monetary advantage. Fortunately, Hollow notices the deception, because otherwise Lawrence would be sitting on a lot of money that would only continue to be worth less and less as time went on. Currency speculation doesn't play much of a role today, but it definitely still exists to some extent. If you can accurately predict changing currency values, you can make a pretty penny. However, excess speculation causes some disastrous results, something we'll go into a bit later. Lawrence and Hollow quickly learn that people like Zarin are far from uncommon. After miraculously coming out ahead from nearly being scammed, they find themselves once again with their backs against the wall, facing another harebrained scheme. In an effort to erase the debt they incurred, they resort to smuggling gold across the border, acting more like pirates than merchants. They plan to sell in a city overseen by the church, as they place a much higher value in gold. Research has actually shown that religiosity and economy are more closely related than one might think. A 2003 paper indicates a positive correlation between religious belief and economic growth, and this was even more true for the medieval period. The Crusades, in particular, spawned an increase in demand for the services of the lower classes, such as blacksmiths. One of the most memorable arcs in Spice and Wolf involves the sale of fool's gold. It opens up the second season on an extraordinary note, and is probably one of my favorites in all of anime. It encapsulates everything Spice and Wolf is about, the marrying of economics and romantic drama. After arriving in the town of Kumerson, and exchanging pleasantries with someone not so pleasant, our duo finds themselves embroiled in an economic bubble in the making. A bubble refers to when an asset is priced way higher than its intrinsic value. It tends to result from excessive speculation, gambling on the idea that something will be worth more in the future than it actually is. Caught up in the excitement of the festival, the medieval equivalent of Dr. Oz is able to sell vast amounts of pyrite, aptly named Fool's Gold. In a desperate attempt to win Hollow back, Lawrence sets out to crash the market, bursting the bubble and bringing demand down to zero. By buying up a large amount and putting it up for sale, the others will want to get rid of their worthless rocks before they end up taking a loss. Lawrence's plan doesn't quite work out the way he expects, however. The amount he scrounges up is nowhere near enough, but after a heartfelt speech from his friend's assistant, he decides to sell anyway. And of course, Hollow comes in to save the day. The reason this arc resonates so much is because it's the first time we see Lawrence unsure of where he stands of Hollow. He gets too caught up in the little brat's, <clears throat> I mean, Amardi's antics to realize that Hollow was on his side from the very beginning. She always is. Lawrence lives the life of a merchant, where everything he deals with on a day-to-day -day basis is basically ever-changing. Prices of goods, the people he trades with, the environment as he moves from town to town. What this arc shows is that in a sea of variables, Lawrence has one unchanging, enduring constant. Hollow. To me, that is an extremely powerful connection. While Spice and Wolf is no substitute for an economics class, and probably won't have you acing your test anytime soon, 
its narrative is still governed by basic economic principles. Even with all the more fantastical elements, much of what transpires has at least some basis in the economic climate of the Middle Ages. You can even see some elements of what Lawrence and Hollow go through today. One might consider the stock market a very complicated version of Coomerson's pyrite ordeal. But what makes the show fantastic is what those basic economic principles stand for, like the loneliness that comes with being a traveling merchant. The transition from acquaintances to friends. How it's healthy to be skeptical of someone proposing a great deal, even those that you felt close to. And in contrast to that, the steadfast trust of someone you love. Thanks for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe for more content. And of course, if anything I said was wrong, I'm sorry. I must have stuttered.